it is appropriately traditional that we focus on the cross on Palm Sunday, the week before Easter Sunday. And with that in mind, we turn our attention today to Calvary. Luke 23 is where our text is found. And the first thing we witness at Calvary is a great hatred, a great hatred. Verse 17 of Luke 23 for of necessity he must release unto them one at the feast. It was an expected custom that at the annual celebration of Passover and the release of bondage from Egypt, the prisoners uh, would be made available and the crowd could select one to be released unto them. Pilate, the governor, offered to release to them the innocent man, Jesus, or the rebel, thief, and murderer, Barabbas. And so we read in verse 18 of Luke 23, And they cried out all at once, saying, Away with this man, and release unto us Barabbas. Pilate, therefore, willing to release Jesus, spake again unto them. But they cried, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. And he said unto them the third time, Why, what evil hath he done? I have found no cause of death in him. <clears throat> I will therefore chastise him and let him go. And they were instant with loud voices, requiring that he might be crucified. And the voices of them and of the chief priests prevailed, and Pilate gave sentence that it should be as they required. <clears throat> Pilate, the governor, is in a dilemma. He assumed that by offering the innocent man, Jesus, they would choose him over the murderer, Barabbas. But their response was loud, unmistakable, and vicious. They cried out repeatedly, crucify Crucify him. Crucifixion was a despicable, horrifying death. It was one of torture and shame. It was reserved for the worst criminals, and it was forbidden for any Roman citizen. And they were instant. This means to press upon. They pressed Pilate, the crowd did. Instant means to rush and swirl like a tempest. They swirled around him. They rushed at him. They screamed at him and they pressed on him to crucify this one. It says with loud voices and they were requiring it. They were asking as their due. You owe us a prisoner to be released. We'll take Barabbas. And as far as Jesus is concerned, we want him crucified. That's our will. That's our plan. That's our purpose. And the voices of them and of the chief priest prevailed. Their voices were saying no. They were saying no to God's Son. They were saying no to God's Savior. They were saying no to God's substitute and sin-bearer, the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you among this crowd, those who are rejecting Jesus, turning from Him, turning away from Him? Are you among those who would have Him crucified because of your hatred? Well, we've witnessed a great hatred, but now we hear something else. We hear of a great danger beginning at verse 27. And there followed him a great company of people and of women, which also bewailed and lamented him. <clears throat> Out of the overcrowded city of Jerusalem, swelled with Passover observers, they, they followed this man, Jesus, the man that they had believed was a prophet from God. The women who followed wept in sympathy and sentimental sadness. This is something they were expected to do. 
in their society and in the culture of that day. So they followed along and they wept and there was quite a number of them. But because Jerusalem and the nation as a whole had rejected their only hope, the Lord Jesus, their Messiah and the Savior from sin, their doom was sealed. Neither is there salvation in any other, Peter would write, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now Jesus uh, himself turns to the crowd that's lamenting him. He had already wept for them. He had just a few days and hours previously overlooked the city of Jerusalem. And in Matthew 23 and Luke 19, this is recorded. And he wept with a broken heart and cried, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them that are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thee as a hen gathers her chicks, but ye would not. Yes, Jesus had already wept, not for himself, but for the city that rejected him. And now turning to these women who were weeping for him, he said this, But Jesus turning unto them said, Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming in which they shall say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bear and the paps which never gave suck. Then shall they begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us and to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things in a green tree, what shall be done in the dry? Jesus was saying to have children in the coming days of judgment will only multiply your agony. If they weep in a time of blessing and opportunity, a green tree, when Jesus was with them, how much more will they weep in the coming devastation and sorrow and days of judgment in a dry tree? This prophecy has a near fulfillment. For in 70 A.D., the Roman general Titus came to the city of Jerusalem and it was destroyed and the temple burned. But it also has an ultimate fulfillment, this prophecy does, in the days when there will be a worldwide judgment in the tribulation. This is a time yet to come, but it is a time that is drawing nearer and nearer and it seems we can see the storm clouds of that tribulation even today. We're not ignorant that the day of the Lord will come. and We can see the signs of the coming of the day of the Lord as we look at our world today. And as this day of the Lord approaches, we also realize that just before it begins, the believers will be caught away, caught out forever to be with the Lord in that time. To reject Christ is to be without any real hope. That's the way it was in that day. There was a great danger looming on the horizon, and so it is in our day. To reject Christ is to be without hope, and there certainly is a great danger looming on the horizon today. Well, we've seen great hatred and a great danger. Now let's behold great grace. Verses 33 and 34. And when they were come to the place, which is called Calvary, they crucified him. And the malefactors, one on the right hand, the other on the left. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Those who were crucifying Jesus and many others who stood by the cross and passed by Golgotha that day did not grasp the magnitude, 
nor the significance of what was happening there. On the cross, the Lord endured the wrath of man. On the cross, He endured the wrath of Satan. And on the cross, He endured the wrath of God. Yet in wrath, the Lord Jesus remembered mercy and prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Jesus prayed for their salvation. That's what He was praying for. For them to be pardoned through repentance and faith, for that's the only way forgiveness comes, through repentance and faith in Christ. For them to be forgiven through repentance and faith when they were brought to realize the truth about Him and what He had done for them and what He was doing for them on that day. You see, the Bible says of the Lord, who will have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. Today, you can be saved. God has not excluded you at all. He's willing for you to be saved. All you have to do is Repent of your trusting in yourself or something else. Repent of your unbelief and put your faith in Christ alone. When you call upon Him in faith to save you, He will in no wise cast you out. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. On the cross we see great hatred, a great danger, and great grace. Now, we also encounter something else at Calvary, and that is great faith. Great faith. Verse 39. And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. Matthew and Mark tell us that both malefactors reviled the Lord Jesus, not just one. But Luke informs us that one of them repented of this evil and defended the Lord, verses 40 and 41. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. And then verse 42, And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. This thief's prayer was, Lord, remember me. It is a prayer prayed elsewhere in the Bible. Samson prayed that prayer. Samson prayed, Lord, remember me when he needed God to restore his strength. And God answered his prayer. And restored his strength. Hannah prayed, Lord, remember me, as she was praying for a son that she would give back to God for his service and his glory. And God answered that prayer, Remember me, and sent her a son named Samuel. Nehemiah prayed, Remember me. He was asking God to remember his service for God in returning to Jerusalem and rebuilding the walls for God's glory. Did God remember him? He certainly did. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 10 says, But God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love. Remember me, a Bible prayer that God hears And that day, that thief on the cross prayed that prayer, Remember me. Remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom, not when you come into paradise, not when you arrive in heaven. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. What does that mean? It means that this man believed that Jesus was God, that Jesus was deity, And that he was going to rule and reign on this earth. He believed in the deity of Christ. He believed in the resurrection of Christ. For he could not have a kingdom if he were not raised. He believed in the millennial reign of Christ. 
You believed in the Lord's power to raise those who had trusted in Him. He believed that Jesus would not only be raised, he also believed that one day Jesus would raise him from the dead and he too would be in the kingdom of God, a living person resurrected and serving God in the millennial kingdom. Oh, what faith, great faith we see here. And what was Jesus' answer to this man? Verse 43, And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Today. Sometimes people who were crucified took two or three days to die. But Jesus said, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. This is a prophetic promise the Lord gives him. Today thou shalt be with me with the Lord Himself. Later, the Apostle Paul would write in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 8, For to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. For you and me today who know Christ, when we die, we are not out in space floating around or somewhere else. We are absent from the body and present with the Lord. The Lord's in heaven. We're present with Him in that place. Today thou shalt be with me in paradise, not purgatory, not a place where you go and finish paying for your sins because we can't pay for our sins. The only payment God accepts for our sin is the blood of Jesus Christ. And it's not of works, lest any man should boast. So no work we can do or no work man on earth can do for us after we're dead can save us. It is not of works, it's by grace, through faith. Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. The Jews called paradise Abraham's bosom. This was a place of loving care and constant comfort. Oh, this man exercised great faith, and so can you and I. We can put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as the God-man, the Savior from sin, the living one, the resurrected one, the glorified one, and the one who's coming back and going to establish his kingdom on earth one day. Well, I would have you see one other thing. Finally, around the cross at Calvary, we see great courage. In verses 44 to 46, we read these words. And it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour from noon to three. And the sun was darkened and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Having said thus, he gave up the ghost. Here we see there was darkness. Darkness when Christ was made sin for us and God the Father forsook his Son Then we see there was a dismissal, a dismissal of His Spirit. Jesus was laying down His life for us, but He would take it again just as He predicted. And the result of this dismissal of His Spirit was death. Christ died for our sins. But I want you to notice there was also there a disciple or there was coming there a disciple, Joseph of Arimathea. We read about him beginning at verse 50. Behold, there was a man named Joseph, a counselor, and he was a good man and a just. The same had not consented to the counsel and deed of them. He was of of Arimathea, a city of the Jews, who also himself waited for the kingdom of God. This man went unto Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. And he took it down and wrapped it in linen and laid it in a sepulcher that was hewn in stone, wherein never before man was laid. Here is Joseph of Arimathea, a disciple. He was a member of the Sanhedrin Council, the ruling body of the Jews. He was a good and just man. That means he was saved. 
In John 19 and verse 38, it tells us he had been a secret disciple for fear of the Jews, that is the other Jewish leaders. But he had not participated, as we've read, in the condemnation of the Lord Jesus by the Sanhedrin. And he lived in anticipation of the kingdom of God on earth. Now he overcomes his fear and boldly identifies with the Savior. How did he do this? I think the key and the clue to it is in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out all fear. Are you fearful? Well, you and I, if we're fearful, when we become fearful, need to draw near to the loving Savior. And as you surrender to Him, He will fill you with His love. He will dispel your fear, and He will give you the courage that you need, even great courage. These are the things we find at Calvary.